And Dr. Weintraub, let me thank you in addition. Once again, this was an expert panel. And thanks once again for answering some of the questions that were not answered earlier. That was very helpful for the, uh, for the group in front of you. Thanks once again, everybody. Well, uh, I want to go now to the uh, section that everybody really in the round table really likes, and that is the reflections uh, on the day. And uh, since I want to get to everybody, and we have about a half hour or so, if we can keep our comments relatively short, but to the point, since I'm sure there are a lot of interest uh, in some uh, commentary on the day's work, uh, that would be very helpful. And uh, we'll start with uh, Dr. Smith. And then we'll go around and come back and we'll, Terry, you'll be last. Bernie, thank you for putting together Goodbye. a great day. Uh, really excellent. Yes. So I, I have two comments. Uh, amongst the 400 questions I wrote myself on, on these four sheets of paper. Uh, I think the one thing that I heard that is worrisome is that with incompatible joint medical records, uh, the use of big data to answer questions that have never been able to be answered before uh, will be impossible. Uh, for instance, uh, our health system is, is committing to literally hundreds of thousands of genetic analyses to try to take our, uh, our uh, medical record, our electronic medical record, and really merge the genetics with the actual uh, disease processes, response to medication, side effects, uh, and familial patterns that are occurring uh, in our patients. And if you leave out behavioral health, where they keep the record secret, uh, and oral health, where it's by practitioners who use completely different products to keep track of, of the patients, uh, you're really going to miss some really, really prevalent and prominent correlations because you just won't see them. And this is clearly one of the places where population health research is moving. Uh, and I think if we don't solve this problem in both situations, actually, behavioral health and oral health, uh, we are going to leave big gaps in the ability to understand the phenotypic, genotypic uh, correlations. The second is that the medical profession, the physician medical profession, uh, has never had higher burnout ever in history as right now. We may well lose a generation of practitioners. And the highest burnout rate is in primary care physicians. And, you know, no offense to my dentist, but my dentist's office looks like a monastery compared to a primary care office. Uh, and the idea that that primary care practitioner would have time to add these things to what they do with patients is insane, absolutely insane. And so if we're going to have a primary care team, we have to be committed that the person with the least educational investment does the maximum that they can be allowed to do and taught to do so that the person with the most investment, the physician who leads the team, is doing only things that require the complexity of training that they received in medical school and residency and not things like this. Uh, and I, I, I feel so strongly that this will just be one more thing that will make everyone want to jump off the bridge. Uh, who's practicing primary care. And I, I think if you've never worked in a primary care office, you're completely missing what is going on right there. The burden on the practitioner is beyond anything that anybody can feel joyful about for the extent of a career. But you're not suggesting that we diminish the opportunity to integrate oral health? And, and not at all. No. Okay. But, but, but the idea that you would, you would train the medical students to be able to do these tasks... We can do that. I think, I think I'd like to know a little bit more about teeth when I look in the mouth. Uh, and I think that, that it would be a positive thing. And I think, you know, but the idea of doing structured oral health screenings is not going to be part of that physician's job. It just can't be. Well, <laughs> well, I've had a very interesting day because this is an area that I'm highly interested in. And I'm a primary care pediatrician. So we've adopted some of these principles of trying to be challenged with integration. Uh, I do think that health literacy can play a critical role in the tsunami that was referred to other for this integration. But I also recognize that it, the task is daunting. 
I think when we talk about the complexity of both of our systems that we have created, whether it's in the dentistry, uh, corporate dentistry, or it's in medical care, it does not work to the benefit of the patient. So getting back to team-based care is probably was the promising thing that I looked at. And I also was very appreciative of um, Snyder's comment of bi-directional. We can't do this always just changing the primary care pediatrician or family practitioner. I think dentistry has to change also, and we can go bi-directional. So I appreciated that, but I also appreciated his point of that system having global integration and a um, global budget and vertical integration. So I think those are some of the things that I think I picked up from today that I think it... Um, causing me to scratch my head as I try to do an integration with the dental hygienists in primary care throughout Wisconsin. So I was really excited to start today and hear um, the commission paper. I was impressed. I think this is one of the better commission papers um, that I've ever really thought about in that it gave us sort of a framework to think about systems that certainly apply here as it relates to oral health, but you can pick up the systems that they talk about and look at the examples that they gave us and apply them in other places, which I think is always, always useful, particularly for folks who are outside of our area right now. So um, I appreciated that systems approach. And then I felt like we were really um, spending a lot of time on the, the sort of um, infrastructure systems, which are not what I do. So I'm a little, a little figuring that out. But I like conceptually the idea that I think Ernestine is getting us to um, in response to some of what I heard Larry say, this idea that we have people who are really well trained, whether they are um, internal medicine or other um, physical health physician leaders or um, dental health physician level leaders who are really highly trained. And then we have all of these other people who have various levels of training and can participate. And we really have to figure out how to make all of those people work together um, in a reasonable way toward the benefit of the patient. And we started to get to a little bit of that at the end of asking patients sort of what matters to them and what's important, which is where the health literacy really comes to life. Um, and I wish we had some more time for that. So I hope we can talk about it some tomorrow. Um, so I, I always go back to when I think about health literacy and sort of um, plain speak and how each individual word that we use actually makes a difference. So I appreciated um, Cassie's comment about reminding um, us about the definition of oral health and sort of starting with that this is really a multifaceted aspect of health and it's not just one thing. So going back to just like oral health itself is multifaceted in order for us to solve, solve, quote unquote, the problem of oral health and um, integration into just general health, we need a multifaceted approach and we've heard all of those things today. So just reminding that it has to be the pipeline of the workforce, building the human capacity, doing more of the research, um, integrating it into the education, changing systems, infrastructure, payment reform, um, and in doing all of that, not um, forgetting about that we really need to also address the social determinants because if not, it's all for nothing. Well, I don't have a whole lot to add to what's been said, but I did want to emphasize uh, the importance of the social context and the social determinants of health and how addressing those in a health literate way can do a lot to promote integration of healthcare providers, just not just physical or oral health, but also behavioral health. And all of that really does need to come together. And I know that healthcare providers struggle with communications between even the primary care, you know, their patients being admitted to the hospital and them not having a way to know about that. So th that whole communication piece among the different pieces of, um, of the health system, I think is going to be really important. And if we can use health literacy kind of as a lever to put pressure on the system to um, better integrate, then you know I think that's going to be where we need to go to integrate physical, behavioral, and oral health. So I have four things. The first thing I got all fired up about public health, uh, oral health, and varnishing going to where the kid is. 
because the kid is always in daycare or at school, and I love that. And I love learning that you don't have to have an MD or a dental degree to be able to do that if we can figure out. And then I've been emailing everybody at home, finding out what we're doing. The head of PEDS wrote me back. We're varnishing. We, the PEDS department, got it. Medicaid to pay for it. He said they're doing it regularly. I don't know what regularly means, however. And um, then he is letting one of the pediatricians go and in-service other pediatricians. We don't have a grant for that. I don't know who's paying for it. And then I just want to do a three health literacy deals. Dental, like medicine, dental health is full of jargon. The two I heard repeatedly today are caries and periodontal. People don't know what that means, but there's plain language. There's cavities and gum disease, and people can understand that, so I'll point that out. I'm working with our dental school. Their patient education consent forms and intake forms need help, and these are low-income people. LSU Health Center New Orleans is treating 54% of people in New Orleans were level one health literacy when they did that 20 years ago. And in stuff that I've seen, it's wordy, it's complex, it's not to the point. They have scary pictures, and it's not really focused on what the patient or the mama needs to know. And then, Linda, maybe you can add on this when it's your turn. One of the things I think the Department of Health did was they art did a survey and asked people, did the doctor give you information you can understand? Did the doctor confirm your understanding, use teach back, and where you offered help with forms. Sometimes I feel like I need help with forms in the dental office. We all do. <laughs> but they could ask dentists that. They could ask that about the dentist. It's not just the medical. Well, have you gone through your immunization physician's office or through Walgreens or whatever? I went, they just said, you're here, you want to push on. But did you have a lot of forms to fill out? Yes, you did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, uh, I'll, I'll just add on to um, uh, Terry's comment about um, clean language. And I think one of the things that would help integration is being able to speak to each other plainly. And so um, I would, that's one of the reasons I was happy to hear about the, the, sort of this new definition of oral health. Um, and I think a couple of us were talking earlier about how even oral health is not quite plain language. And so, um, you know, so I think those are the things that I was uh, perking up with on today. So, um, so, so I was thinking about the importance of uh, dental health to our overall health, just how much it impacts us, the fundamental functioning that we every day, speaking, communicating, eating, your self-confidence. Um, and so it really does emphasize that we need to integrate these two areas. Um, and then thinking about the economic costs and, um, and how important it is to, to talk about that and, and integrate that with people's stories, like the stories of how it's affecting their you know, fundamental eating, speaking, getting a job. I thought all that was really important. Um, and then kind of what Terry was, Dr. Davis was saying, um, I do work with youth. That's one way. I do CBPR work, community-based participatory research, and um, my community partners talked about the way to reach um, reach the community and to be change agents was to go through the kids. And so I think that that's a, an important area to go into. And um, so that public health literacy really resonated with me. Um, so... For uh, today, uh, again, I agree that there, the impact of oral health um, was surprising and how much it actually impacts us in a many in multitude of ways. Um, I think uh, addressing the oral health uh, disparities right now uh, really just goes back to the basic right to um, health care, uh, you know, basically getting um, the needs to address all these issues. So health insurance uh, really should be more global. It should be dental and you know, our medical insurance, it should not be separate. Um, it, I mean, it makes it onerous, uh, inefficient, and unfortunate for um, many people in our country. So that needs to be addressed. Um, until we get that addressed, I mean, I think we're kind of struggling with a lot, a lot of, uh, you know, pilot programs, uh, piecemeal, uh, trying to address these gaps. 
Um, the pipeline comment I made, uh, I think it's really important for uh, dentistry to address so that we can attract uh, dental students and dent, uh, dental faculty members and also people who want to go back to the communities uh, where they came from to address uh, areas where it's just lacking care. Uh, so we need to do more on that. And then lastly, again, just thinking about the disruptive uh, technology. I mean, there was a couple comments that were made. Uh, so expanding on that, I think it's critical. A couple, couple things, and it really a lot of the, a lot of the first thing just resonated when uh, Dr. Smith uh, and Mike McKee just, just kind of their comments over the days about, uh, uh, over the day about primary care physicians being overburdened and how do we create a coordinated care model that, uh, that works in all areas. And so, um, and I appreciated kind of the first panel we're talking about the IP and the educational models uh, about kind of creating this care team. And my wife is a, is a PA educator. And so I was texting her today and um, she was mentioning about the different out, the number of hours that they that her students have and that they just finished a ver uh, varnish training and certification program so they can apply it at health fairs and other places like that. And I think, you know, embracing more of that and making it aware. That's the first time I've really been aware that it's not necessarily dentists or, uh, you know, dentists or primary care providers that can do these type of things. It can be done by a five year old. I thought that was great. Um, and the other thing that kind of really, through all the talk about systems and integration and those type of things, it really struck me that this is, there's a lot of haves and have nots in oral health, not only from vulnerable populations and non-vulnerable populations, but from smaller, you know, smaller health systems to larger health system, I thought, larger health systems. I think if, if this is all, if, if our efforts are largely government program driven or driven by large uh, integrated multi-billion dollar corporations, we're not going to truly see saturation and change. We're just going to see, you know, pockets of change where there happens to be the uh, money or, um, you know, the political will to do so. And so that's kind of one of the, so those are the, some of the things that resonated well with me today. As, as a practicing pediatric dentist uh, and being on this roundtable for almost six years now, I'm just so thankful for uh, the National Academies and for this roundtable to have been such so supportive of the work that ultimately the culmination of that work ha was the commission paper and the convening of this workshop. And I'd like to s specifically thank uh, our past director who retired uh, this summer, Lila Hernandez. Lila, are you still here? Just left. She just left. Well, ah, well, it's on the record then. So, Lila was instrumental in moving this forward and being incredibly welcoming to me when I first came on the, uh, the round table in really shepherding this whole, um, this whole topic. Um, and helping me understand, the rest of us who are interested in this, understand how to best um, use this uh, convening body in the workshop as a platform for getting people's opinions out, you know, especially in terms of identifying the gaps in research and where we need to move forward in the uh, best interest of uh, improving oral health literacy and overall health literacy of vulnerable po populations especially. I want to thank also Alice Horowitz, who has been an incredible champion and mentor throughout the years. And she was part of the Dental Collaborative from the beginning, as was David Gesco uh, from Health Partners, and also Lori Francis, who turned off the roundtable. She's from the Oregon Primary Care Association. Just have a couple things I wanted to mention. Uh, Bernie, you, you talked about the convening of the Oral Health Literacy Workshop in 2012. And there were a few of us who were there in the room. I was one of them. And I remember the keynote address, uh, which was delivered by Congressman Elijah Cummings. And uh, Diamante Driver, uh, we all know, passed away, uh, and it was because of a dental infection that spread uh, to his brain. And Diamante Driver, his family, lived in Elijah Cummings District. And we know Diamante Driver's name because of Mr. Cummings, because of people who were champions around the family, like Lori Norris and the press who got involved and let 
the let the entire country know about what happened. And I think it's important that this is a really a reflection that his death was a reflection of, of a systems failure. And it's you need those champions to in order to overcome barriers, uh, whatever they may be, economic, policy, educational, uh, health literacy, or health literacy um, barriers. I was also struck by um, what Dean Schillinger was proposed, this construct of public health literacy and the notion of the soci excuse me, the socio <clears throat> ecological model and the sheer risk factors across different health domains, the oral, mental health, and overall health domains, and the emphasis um, that w uh, on needing to address the social determinants to improve um, health outcomes, oral health outcomes, and general health outcomes, especially for those who are the most vulnerable populations. I mean, we saw great examples uh, in the commission paper and here today um, of health partners and Marshfield and, and uh, Kaiser uh, Permanente. But when you think about the most vulner vulnerable, they're not going to be, we need to, we need to reach out and, and access them and, and get them into the, the system um, it, it, in community-based settings. And I think that's what, when I think about what Dean was offering, that really made me, really made me understand how important that is to get out of the de dental office, get out of the physician's office, and move into the community, where the kids are, where the families are. The last thing I wanted to mention <clears throat> was the fact that the dental profession has schizophrenia around their relationship with medicine and it's especially reflected in policy statements um, from various dental associations, and I'm not just talking about the ADA, I mean there are others as well, um, especially as they relate to the financing of dental care within large complex governmental programs, and I'm thinking Medicaid, Medicare, and the regulatory burden that goes along with that participation. But I have to say, as a private practitioner, the majority of dentists are still have running a small business. It's very difficult to manage those burdens when you're trying to run a business and paying all the bills. So I think that's where integration will help overcome those barriers and perhaps make some dentists more willing and able to participate more highly. I would, I would certainly hope so. Final thing I wanted to say was the, that I echo, echo what a few of the speakers have said about the importance of team care and having each member of that team practice at the top of the scope. I mean, the last thing we need is burnout of our primary care providers. And we, we definitely, I mean, I, 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 I'm not in, a, in a concierge primary care practice because that's the only way that I could get access it was for my primary care physician. In fact, she told me the story of why she ended up in a concierge practice, because she was burning out and she had to limit her practice, but then we have to pay out of pocket to have that service. So I really totally understand that. But I think dentistry needs to understand that in order for, for um, dentists to be able to provide and expand a level of care, they need to be more open at the state level to expanding scope. And I'm not talking about dental therapy. I'm talking about just the existing practitioners we have to let them do a, a host of other functions that they were trained to do. So thank you. Moving on. Thank you very much. And I'll be much shorter today. <laughs> much shorter. Um, I agree with everyone. It was a really uh, stimulating day, and I learned a lot about the relationship between oral health and, and the... Um, Rest of, rest of health. I was very interested in how the Marshfield Clinic was um, um, integrating uh, um, their medical and dental records through, um, through EPIC and starting, and also the data warehouse and being able to do some data mining on that. One of the reasons I was particularly interested in that is we're just in the process of doing that at, um, at Columbia. One of the things I wanted um, to mention as part of our um, integration in preparation for that, there is simulation training that um, that happens across the professional students. And one of the things that we're talking about is we, uh, medicine, dentistry, and nursing, are work to, working together to um, 
create or share some common clinical simulation. So I think that would mean that the oral would get um, integrated with the medical as, as, because I think it's very important in, um, um, once again, in pipeline training to make sure that, that that's being um, role modeled. And I will mention one other thing. We do have a lot of interprofessional training and we actually do have a, a nurse who's jointly appointed um, in the School of Dentistry. <laughs> so that makes it easier for some of the interprofessional education to uh, occur. Thank you. Um, so it was a very rich day, and being in dentistry for 45 years, all of the things that you were all talking about, I'm like, yes, 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 for the whole entire day long. Um, I would echo uh, several comments in Dr. Robinson's most recently that the the uh, what Dean Schillinger, what Dr. Schillinger had to say was fundamental, I think, to moving the needle on this, um, engaging across the social services where uh, oral health literacy practices are fundamental to success. Whatever else we do, if we don't get that, we're not going to move the needle where it needs to move because we all know that clinical services themselves are a small part of the health of someone. Having said that, there were two things that stuck out to me that if I could just have a magic wand and, ha and have it these be different. One is that uh, we have, we heard about best practices that are out there, but uh, there, there is an element of, uh, I don't know another way to say this right now, except but follow the money. When the payers, when the medical payers see the benefit and they feel the benefit, the needle will start to move. And because that hasn't moved as much as it could, that's where I'd be focusing um, uh, research. Getting... So, so they're saving money. So the re reason to do this, I mean, and if we, if we had a demonstration project in Medicare where we focused on people with bi diabetes, for example, one specific thing, and we could prove, look at this, look at how much you're saving. And that is happening in places. But I think we need to laser focus there and then have a concerted effort to use that information. What's out there now, I hear people say, well, yeah, I don't know how well, how good that study was. You know, I don't think it was a controlled study. That just laser focused on the return on investment. Here it is. I think that moves the needle. And the other thing is the integrated records. So, uh, so I know there's Epic. There's some things going on in integrated records. But they're commercial products for the most part, and they're not motivated to do much. I've got mine. You've got yours. There's no reason to somehow really uh, getting someone, her or someone, to fund a solid integrated record that could be widely disseminated and used would also make a huge difference. So the commercial world doesn't have a lot of, apparently, doesn't have a lot of um, reasons to be doing that. So those are my high points. Um, I just want to thank um, everyone for this. As a dentist, I think uh, to have oral health elevated to this level, so kudos to Dr. Robinson and to, to Alice and to um, everyone who was part of the collaborative um, that came out of the, the NAS. Thank you, guys, because, again, just kind of showing my students back home who were in school today so they couldn't necessarily watch it, but they were also excited, too, that oral health has been elevated to this level. Um, so... It's exciting for us. Still processing a lot of what took place today because there's a lot um, as part of the planning committee that we packed into this and um, a lot to take away. But I, I do want to say for, for me, certainly, and I mentioned it before, um, Dean's point that uh, from a research agenda, the language we use, and we know that language certainly affects the way we perceive the world. And within dentistry, and particularly my dental field of facial pain, um, the terminology is all over the place. People don't know what we're talking about from TMJ to TMD and so on and so forth, that's just one example. But within general oral health, I think that's certainly a research area of some basic questions that we haven't asked yet from a research standpoint that we could look into. Um, and that would certainly um, lift both oral health and, and general health. And then the other thing that I, I'm just thinking about is we heard a very elegant definition of, of oral health. And I think to take a step back and think about just health in general. Um, and obviously, oral health is a part of that. Um, and I just feel as though for, for us to think about health literacy as this facilitator to, to kind of integrate oral health and general health, if you will, um, it was said earlier that it would be kind of a, a shared responsibility. But I, I, I've been thinking it's not just responsibility. It's more so the, the accountability of all the providers and really, truly going back to why are we in this? Because we do know there's so many 
the majority of dental diseases are preventable, right? But the disease burden is still so high. And so when we think about whose responsibility it is, we, we do need to think about that critically, but also what are we accountable for as providers and clinicians and, and professionals in, in the health field? So again, still processing, but thank you to all who were involved in participating today. Um, so I really appreciated this session a lot because um, today's workshop because I didn't really actually know a lot of the connection between oral health and especially because I had a personal experience with a family member just about two months ago who um, went ended up in the ER and it turned out it was because she had the dental um, issue that she hadn't taken care of and it ended up costing a lot of money to um, pay, of course, for an emergency room visit. And so I appreciated learning a lot about the connection. I think one of the things I was sort of looking for today was sort of tying back sort of the health literacy concept to when a patient actually is in the dental chair in the way we communicate health information. I don't think my dentist ever uses teach back with me. I don't think the way information is communicated with me is um, different than, for example, about what periodontal disease is, for example. And even the dental hygienist, like even just showing how to floss, for example, like little things I think can be done in a way to sort of enhance the communication about oral health. And I think even if it's just that little piece where we start from in sort of enhancing health literacy and bringing forth those health literacy principles, I think it would go a long way. So, thank you. Linda. So, Lindsay, Alice, thank you all both so much for your leadership on this. It was a great day for me. Um, and it um, helped me start to think about um, and based, uh, uh, as reflected in my questions about, okay, how does this health literacy as a driver, uh, you know, how can we uh, kind of fit health literacy, um, not just with the words, but helping to simplify the system so that it's more navigable. That's also really a important health literacy concept. And it seems to me, and I haven't really put all the pieces together, I would love for somebody to be able to do that, but there's got to be a way to connect the dots in a, in a Medicare um, pilot project or demonstration project that connects, you know, using vulnerable people whose system uh, experience is simplified in a way that helps them be more informed, to, which is essential for having that quality, I mean, that value-based care system to work. So there's got to be a pony in here somewhere. And I had not seen that before. And I really appreciate today helping me kind of get a, a beginning of a sense of, of what that might look like. Well, then the right people are in this room to begin a pilot, as you have just suggested. So that conversation should continue. Steve. Hi, yes. Steve Rush, United Health Group. And I'd like to thank the staff for putting together a really tremendous program. I really, and the, also the presenters, I like the foundational component that we had this morning. And then I really appreciated beginning to understand the business case for health, for oral health literacy and the integration of oral health and general health. I think what I just hearken back to the fact that there was some research done at United Health Group which took a look at the cost savings of people who went to spine specialists first, so physical therapists and chiropractors. And they took a look at the costs associated with not going to those groups. And they found that it was a significant difference. And one of the things that happened based upon that research and then some opioid kinds of research was that United Health Care changed its benefit design so that people could go to those spine specialists first with little or no copay so or coinsurance. So it's my word of encouragement is keep going, focus on the business case, begin to figure out how to present that to decision leaders in the states, in the healthcare industry, 
and um, keep going. And so thank you very much. Hi, I'm Lori Hall. I'm from Eli Lilly and Company. And um, I, I will be brief in that um, one of the things that I think um, we have more opportunity to discuss in the future uh, has to do with um, understanding where patients, um, meeting patients where they are. And we've talked a lot about our discussion was about patients or for patients, but the missing piece for the evolution of this discussion is to talk with patients. And um, we have... Uh, a number of best practices that we can lean on for inspiration for that. One is the patients included movement, which talks about um, their tagline is nothing about me without me. The other piece I think that's quite important is also leveraging what we've learned about the role that health literacy plays um, in general health and uh, what we know about non um, the factors that influence non-adherence in patients. Um, I think that kind of a research um, uh, perspective on what what are uh, the the factors that contribute to patients not adhering to a a, um, a healthy oral and dental regime. Um, and then the the other thing is uh, one of the health literacy best practices that we are very familiar with um, is the uh, the idea of participatory design. So involving uh, representatives from the tar target audiences in the planning, implementing, disseminating, and evaluating of, of information regarding their oral health and services would take this conversation to the next level. So I'm between you, everyone, and dinner, right? <laughs> and drinks. <laughs> Terry Parnell, Health Literacy Partners. So ditto to everything that's been said. I, I just want to um, make a few quick points. The way that the planning committee aligned all the presentations, I mean, it just built, kept building to a crescendo, you know, at the end. This morning, building with the foundation, the commission paper, a few phrases, put the mouth back in the body, you know, shifting again to more holistic, person-centered care. Um, Dean and Meg's presentation, you know, after the, the foundational paper, um, the upside-down T, I thought was amazing, aligning with the social determinants of health. And then after lunch, you know, there was, it just continued. And um, the best practices with medical and dental integration uh, of the electronic medical records, aligning with HITUS me measures, um, and then sharing the um, Into the Mouths of Babes program I thought was great. And ending with, you know, the future research for integrating oral health um, and general health, I thought it was so interesting that um, we came back to m many of the same themes we talk about when we talk about just aligning health literacy um, with everything. Things like, you know, additional health um, professional education is needed, consistency of definitions, you know, practicing to the full scope of practice, breaking down the silos, um, looking at our measures, you know, are they health outcome measures or are they system measures, um, innovative technology, telemedicine, many of those very same themes that we talk about. So um, one of the best roundtables, I thought, myself, and uh, congrats to the planning committee. I thought it was extremely well done. Thank you. Uh, let me add to that, uh, Terry. I think this, uh, I will close by thanking the speakers and the panelists and the moderators for really a very insightful and thought-provoking uh, day. And certainly the planning committee, and I, I never forget Melissa and Alexis, because uh, although they're very quiet during the day, uh, they're responsible for a lot of what uh, has accomplished. So thank you both. You know, as I listen today, uh, certainly integrating oral health and general health through health literate practices certainly will help us achieve the quadruple aim. And that last aspect of, uh, of what Don Berwick started with the triple aim, that's now the quadruple aim, to achieve what we know is a big problem, a better provider satisfaction and less burnout is really important, and I think some of, that, some of that discussion was brought out today. In addition, the concept of value, which is, I think, what we were referring to before, and that's the, the uh, cost-effectiveness versus uh, outcome, uh, is uh, clearly a case that we can easily make by integrating oral and general health through health literate practices. Uh, 
So I think all the points were very well done. I think that uh, we have a lot to think about, and we can begin some of that discussion tomorrow, Larry, as we uh, uh, reflect on today's, uh, on today's uh, discussions. I think we'll have a good opportunity to bring forth and um, uh, some, some very good concepts uh, and help both the medical profession and the dental profession integrate a little bit further and uh, uh, avoid some of the problems that Lindsay perhaps uh, reflected on in her, in her comments. And by the way, thank you, Lindsay, for being a spokesperson for this, for the time that I've been on uh, this, um, this uh, wonderful workshop uh, and roundtable, and uh, we appreciate your bringing these matters to our attention and keeping the focus and putting us in the right, in the right perspectives. So thanks again. So I'll conclude by uh, adjourning the, uh, the today's roundtable. Thanks once again for everybody's participation. And uh, we'll see the roundtable members at uh, dinner. Thank you very much. <clears throat>